Welcome to SGHB TV. I'm your host, Sophia Haver Brock, and today I'm joined by stand up comedian and writer Nimesh Patel. So, thank you for joining me today. Um, thank you. I know you've been waiting for a while to get on the show, so <laughs> <laughs> thanks for uh, coming on. Um, a pleasure. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to reach the youth if I can. Yeah. And, and that's really, and you worked at Vinny's Club, so that's why I'm here. Uh, yeah. So I appreciate you taking the time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Hopefully reach some of the people at Fairfield University and, and beyond. So you have an incredible resume. You've written for SNL, the Oscars, Jimmy Fallon, you've been on Jimmy Fallon, 1.2 million on TikTok, which is very impressive. Um, so I know you went to NYU and you started in pre-med and finance, that's what your track was going to be. And then you ended up being a comedian. So yeah. I'm sure a lot of young people would like to hear your story about that. Like, how was your experience at NYU and how, how did your love for comedy even start? Uh, well, I started comedy in 09, a year after I graduated from NYU, which is in 2008. And I graduated with a finance degree, which is about the uh, funniest thing you could do at the time. And that's why I'm here, really. Uh, okay. that comedy was not something that I was like, oh man, I really want to become a comedian from the jump. It was something I kind of just fell into. And uh, once I started, it was really hard to not continue doing it. Uh, and that was really it. You know, it was just like, okay, I kind of fucked up but all the other plans that I had. Let's not fuck this one up. Um, and that's, that's really it. Yeah. <laughs> that's really funny. Like, especially like being a doctor and a comedian are like the literal opposite things. And I know you, you said, uh, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> but I, I know you've said that you like, don't have, you didn't have stage fright or like you're felt comfortable going up on stage. Like, it, is that just a trait you had from when you were young or? Oh, I just focus. Um, the lack of focus on my camera is annoying <laughs> me. Uh, I, I had a, a shot of video this week and uh, my video guy, I think, Change my settings and not change it back. Oh, um, what was the question? Sorry. I think it's, I had no stage fright because I grew up with a lot of cousins. And that was always a matter of like talking shit in front of them and like their friends and our friends. And we always had a big group that I was always kind of talking in front of. So that kind of translated to not having stage fright because it just felt like I was talking to a larger group of people. And then in, you know, high, throughout high school, um, you know, I was president of clubs and had to speak in front of lots of people a lot of times. So I think that kind of just translated pretty well. Um, in terms of like the, the confidence of getting on stage um, and thinking of wanting to do comedy, I took a like really corny writing class before I started comedy mm -hmm. after I graduated. And uh, I didn't really like the tone of the writing was really like emotional and sappy it just didn't feel good at the time um and so stand up just felt like okay i can make fun of whatever emotions i'm experiencing and, and have a lot more fun and i don't even have to talk about my feelings i can just talk about the world and all that kind of stuff and so it was it just felt like oh let me try that i grew up you know liking chris rock and, and russell peters and so i think their voices were in the back of my head as well like hey just do stand up and that's really what happened. That's great. And um, talking about Chris Rock, can you tell the story of how you got noticed <laughs> by him and that little story? Yeah, it's my favorite story to tell. One of them. Uh, you know, I, I used to run a show in Brooklyn uh, with my dear friends uh, uh, Mike Denny and Michael Che, and uh, you know, it became a very popular show by 2015. Chris was there to see someone else. Uh, I went up. And because it was my show, I was like, there's no way I'm not performing in front of Chris. And uh, I did well. And that was really it. Um, I heard him laughing. I was like, OK, off to the races. Did like 12 minutes. He came out afterwards after watching the other comic uh, who went up right after me and told me I was funny. And that was really all I needed to sustain uh, to this day. And, uh, you know, a few months later, he got the writing job. I mean, he got the hosting job for the Oscars. And, you know, I got an email saying, Chris wants you to be on the writing team. And that was really it. Like, mm -hmm. I wish it were a lot more glorious. But, I mean, I think it was really just like one, two, three. It was kind of crazy, actually. Yeah, that's amazing that, like, an icon like that he looked up to. 
and like kind yeah. of in the beginning of your, of your career too it wasn't like in the end someone that big said that yeah. and it's cool that you have like because I've, I've watched like a few of your podcasts and you've told like stories like you, you do have a lot of luck like and you're very intuitive I guess right too like you you took advantage of that like cool moment and you went up and like that's that's an awesome trait to have which is yeah, it's all luck it's all luck uh, <laughs> not, and not shrinking from the moment yeah uh, I've, I've definitely shrank from moments before um, and definitely not noticed when luck was being given to me. Uh, but in the few moments that the stars have aligned, I, I did uh, uh, strike when the iron, well, strike when the opportunity was there, you know. Mm -hmm. That's great. And I'm sure a lot of young people want to have that trait. So I, I, I hope so. You know, it's, it's hard to develop, it's hard to uh, recognize, but. You know, when when the clouds part and the sun shines through, you should definitely you know bask in the sun when you can. And so, it was one of those moments where I was like, "Oh, this is it. This is one of those like the balls, the, the shot clock's winding down. I got the ball. I'm feeling it. Let me see what happens." You know, worst thing that happens is uh, a bomb in front of my idol, but then he doesn't know who I am anyway. Um, so, yeah, you know, but, and it's fine. So I know you, then you got that gig from Chris Rock. And so I, I know on your podcast, like podcast you've been on, you've said like, you thought that was going to be your big break. Like, oh, I'm going to be so big after that. And then like, you just kept going and like kept, it was just like normal after that, right? So yeah, sure. what were you going to say? <laughs> I was going to say, you know, no, you're right. I, I really thought that was going to be after the Oscars that I was going to be, uh, rich, famous, from doing every writing thing there was, but uh, I had not learned to manage my expectations um, up until that point. I had, but I always very, very promptly forgot that lesson. Um, yeah. Uh, which is, you know, in hindsight, I wish I always had very high hopes. I tried to maintain those <laughs> um, and, and try not to, not try not to uh, feel bad when they don't come to fruition. Uh, but I was very grateful, obviously, that, you know, I had that opportunity and then I just kept working because uh, I really had no other choice. Yeah. And it's like funny because that one thing you didn't get big from. But then TikTok, on the other hand, like overnight, you could post one thing and then you blow up, which is like crazy. It is kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, although the blow up and the glow up on TikTok uh, a, is hard to maintain. But B, it was not overnight. It was uh, oh, yeah, yeah. a huge sustained it feels like it was overnight because it was, you know, uh, almost overnight. And if by overnight, you mean like two, three, four months, six months, you know, uh, which in the understanding of the, the chronology of this whole comedy career I've built, it, it kind of feels overnight because you know, I've been doing up until TikTok happened, I've been doing comedy for 12, 13 years um, in all of my touring and stand up. Uh, Club, nightclub success has been over the last three years or so. Um, so yeah, I think overnight is not an overstatement. It's just not like, it wasn't like 10 minutes, you know, it was more like yeah. a few months. But yeah, um, a, a lot of luck being in the right place at the right time and uh, taking advantage of the moment, you know. Are you checking your phone like 24 seven now with all of this like social media buzz or like how, how do you work with your uh, phone? It's a lot to manage because the phone is a poison like i like i said that joke at, at this uh at stress factory not too long it lasted two three weeks ago um it is poison uh it's definitely rotting my brain and definitely rotted a lot of millions of brains across the country uh, across the world um but you know for the first six months when i was managing everything on my own uh it was definitely a tax on my my, my mental health um and i recognize that early on and I realized I need to make a change and so I hired a team to help uh, do everything and still manage the team I still check my phone but it's a lot less than I was doing beforehand it consumes a lot less time mm -hmm. and uh, I've always found that you know on the weekends when I tend to check it less frequently I definitely just have more time to do other stuff and I feel better and uh, it took me a while to pinpoint why and it was I realized it was because I wasn't on my phone as much and so yeah. Young people out there, get off your phones, go outside. The world is great. Uh, have some fun.
Yeah, it's definitely, I imagine it's very different having a team behind it. So it's not like you have to like do it all yourself, right? Which Correct. that's what you were doing before. You were doing everything yourself, like editing. And yeah, not editing, but uh, posting the, the tedious stuff that I could manage. Posting and uh, writing the captions and, uh, you know, resizing for every every platform, all that just took so much work and time, like four or five hours out of my day that I needed back desperately. I'd go to sleep thinking about what I was going to say and wake up thinking about what I was going to comment. And so that that burden was, once that burden was lifted, it was, it was very cool. Mm. And I, I mean, there, you've done so much, like I would want to talk about everything, but obviously we don't have time for that. But like you have really cool experiences, like, um, like being on the late night shows and like the White House Correspondents Dinner and Aquafina and I mean you've done a lot like do you have any um, really memorable experiences from your fading, favorite writing experiences not just stand up? Uh, uh, well yeah I mean I got a lot uh, yeah, I've done I've been fortunate to to have random opportunities pop up for me um, and again like a lot of it being in the right place at the right time um, and knowing when I was in those moments, um, you know, starting with, you know, obviously the Oscars was, you know, the first, that was my first writing job and it was a great one. Um, I learned a lot from it. You know, my second writing job, I think was the congressional correspondence dinner with Hasan Minaj. And, uh, that was like his pre white house correspondence dinner one. And I'd known Hasan for, you know, probably about 15 years now, uh, more than that. But before I, we even start, before I started calm down doing it. But, um, and so like that writing job was fun. That was like one of those cool things. Like, uh, you know, one of the jokes I helped them write ended up going viral, which was super awesome to see and be a small part of, you know, my friend's success in that regard. Um, and then, you know, I wrote for Aquafina before she was Aquafina. She had a show called, uh, Talk with Aquafina on a, a now defunct network called Go90, which was a Verizon offshoot. That was just like me and two other people, which was, you know, again, like a very incredible experience. Um, in hindsight, at the time, I wasn't really cognizant of what Aquafina was going to turn into and, and how her career was going to take off. But, you know, she's obviously a mega star now. Um, that was super fun. You know, I wrote my own show called Rhyme and Reason, which is sold to MTV2. Uh, which is uh, my first pilot that I sold, my, I think my last up until this point, but uh, that was like an awesome experience I had with Mookie Thompson. My favorite little story, I mean, SNL, uh, obviously uh, an incredible time. I was there for season 2017 and 2018, season 43, which was awesome. Um, I was just trying to think like, Writing for Lily Singh was my last writing job before uh, uh, becoming like a, just purely touring stand-up. And that was one of my most fun jobs because it was a very small writer's room. Uh, we were face-to-face -face with Lily every day. And uh, uh, like I could really be myself the most because it was just like turning my ideas into sketches for, and, you know, bits for her. Um, and that was just like, overall, the ability to translate my stand-up into sketches um, was not something I knew I would be able to do so easily. Because when I was at SNL, I wrote a weekend update. So that was like writing pure jokes. This was like, I have this joke about Justin Trudeau wearing blackface. How do I turn it into a thing Lily Singh would do? She didn't end up doing it, obviously, because she's boys with Justin. But um, it was like it was a very fun kind of different experience for me, and I, I look forward to hoping to do that again sometime. And how do you feel when, like, writing and you being a stand-up? Like, what if you wrote something really great for these other people and not, like, you know what I mean? Like, how do you feel not being able to do it on stage yourself? Oh, I mean, that doesn't really bother. If they don't use it, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, so it doesn't bother me uh, at all. It doesn't it, and it doesn't bother me as much as it did um, if I write something and if they don't use it. Uh, you know, it's it's just part of the game. Yeah. You know, it's not like, it's never personal. It's just the uh -huh. business is the business. You got to just got to keep throwing stuff at a wall. And um, to talk about your 
uh, stand up, you have like a really unique, awesome crowd play. Like you have a great talent of like connecting with people and like even little things like remembering their names and going like going back to them. Um, and like I noticed like on your Instagram stories, I don't know if it, this is you or your people, but like you write little notes about people. Like it's very personalized, which I thought is nice. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. Is is that your it, did you come up with that or that's like your social media strategy to try to no, connect? No, that's me. That's me in the green room afterwards uh, trying to remember everyone that I talked to. <laughs> and I've, I've been pretty good. I think I have like a 90%, 99% hit rate. Like I usually get everybody. I think once or twice I've missed somebody and they've been like, what about me in the DMs? But <laughs> um, for the most part, that's just a way to uh, recap more for myself. Uh who I talk to and it's really just me like testing my own brain power to see if I can remember everybody yeah <laughs> um, while I'm in the room it's more again like I have 16 first cousins and a, and a younger sister and so like remembering names isn't as hard as it is for me as it might be from some other people I don't ask me to remember them like 10 minutes after yeah. uh, the show's over. Um, after I post that shit on the Instagram story or whatever, like I don't, their, their memories, their brain yeah. is, their, their names are gone from my brain, but um, it's just a, it's not like even a, not necessarily a party trick it used to be, but it's more just like, yeah, what we said, it's a way to connect, a way to people feel uh, like they were more part of the show than they were, or, you know, just add a little flavor that's different than what everyone else is doing. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, the crowd plays just to make sure you're paying attention to the material. You know, like, uh, I think uh, crowd work is having like a very big moment at the time in, in stand up in general. And I'm happy to have been part of that if I have been part of it, which I think I have been. But at the same time, you know, I didn't get into it to just do crowd work. You know, uh, yeah. on, again, like you saw at the show, it's not just fucking with the audience members. Those are like memorable parts because people like those are like the peaks that happen in between the other small peaks, between, you know, um, and sometimes those moments are just the most insane. Um, but whatever helps you leave that thinking, oh, this guy's a very good comedian like, and his jokes are very strong. Mm -hmm. um that's that's always the goal yeah that's great and um so i know during the show i noticed that you go on your phone at the end like and i saw that you posted something too like with your notes is mm -hmm. do you just like write your notes in a note in the notes app and then like review it after to make sure you hit everything or what, what is that about over the summer as i'm you know i'm doing a theater tour this fall yeah yeah uh, um but over the summer you know i've got a, a another hour to a craft and uh, a lot of that is like, okay, I wrote jokes and I have things that I want to remember and bullet points and order and structure and all that. And it's very hard from the beginning if you like to get into the rhythm of a set uh, uh, to remember the order if you haven't done it a billion times. And so when I'm on stage with notes at the clubs, it's like, okay, I got to, did I, did I hit everything I want to talk about? Yeah, I wrote something new in the green room. Yeah, make sure I talked about that. And, yeah. Uh, that's really it. It's just like a, because it's still very new in my brain. Like if I were to go up on stage right now uh, without notes, I could probably do 30 or 40 without anything. Um, but at, the order would be all over the place and I wouldn't remember necessarily what I was yeah. talking about, where I was talking about it. Yeah. Um, and I, I wonder. A billion times. I wonder, like, do you get tripped up too? Like, since you're repeating it so much, like, I, I notice, like, even in your all the podcasts you've been on, you have like the same jokes you say. Like, do you, like that must be, like, it's kind of like your script for life now, I guess, right? Like, it is. I mean, it becomes like, a, uh, it's it's an annoying um, part of this business, so to speak. That, like, even on podcasts, like, you have like. Well, people ask the same questions and I've asked this, I've yeah. answered the same questions before and I know what's the best way to answer it. And uh, my brain, the first time I said it, I was like, oh, this is funny or this is what the anecdote is. But since then, it's like I haven't really thought about it. Um, so my brain goes into the sort of autopilot mode. On stage, it's 
the trick is to kind of make it feel fresh every time. Uh, yeah. And the way to do that is interject something new or change the order up or fuck around or just not commit to memorizing it and uh, being like, okay, let's see where I can fuck around and uh, uh, see where my brain takes my stuff. I know my 10 pole bits and uh, as long as I get to them, I'll be good. Um, yeah. But otherwise, like, I don't know. I like the tour is called Fast and Loose for a reason. Like I'm trying to be as loose and fun with this next one as possible um, because I, I I feel that what you just said of like it does become kind of rote and annoying and and uh, um, what's the word robotic almost you know yeah. which I don't enjoy definitely. So what's next for you? Yeah, you could talk about your tour a little bit. Yeah, for sure. You know, just check me out on Finding Me Mesh on on all the platforms, but. Uh, uh, I'm coming to Bridgeport, my sharp bar that is from Fairfield. Um, but yeah, it's, right. it's like five minutes away, actually. <laughs> okay, yeah, so I'll be there at Vinny's uh, Stress Factory in Bridgeport in in August. Um, that's probably one of the last uh, shows I do before I hit the road. I start in London in September, and I go until December 30th at the theater at Madison Square Garden. Um, and so uh, hopefully I'll record a special there at the Garden. Um, that night uh, but yeah. yeah that's really it you know it's just tour 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 stand up stand up stand up see what happens um, and then I, wherever life awesome. goes it goes it, was that like your dream to play there I, I, you said that in one of your podcasts I don't know if you're just like exaggerating but it's a it's a dream I didn't know I had um, yeah. you know you don't think you're going to do the garden i mean granted it's not the arena where the knicks play but it's still yeah. for me a little feather in my cap that oh man i'm doing uh madison square garden um uh, yeah i mean it's going to be insane I, I i can visualize it now what it's going to feel like i've seen the stage um and so i'm looking forward to gracing it and uh making that new year's eve eve show one for new york to remember you know that's great. Yeah, I hope your tour goes well. And um, or are you planning on like after your tour? Do you have any plans coming up? Like, are you gonna do any like movies or like? I don't know, what's uh, what's next well, for your? I don't know. What's next for your career? Or, who knows? Um, right now, I'm just enjoying this uh, roller coaster I'm on. Um, I, I haven't planned past uh, December thirtieth. Right now. Um, <laughs> okay. We'll see where life in in my career goes. Um, hopefully, you know. I'm sure I'll tour a little bit longer um, if if I if nothing else pops up. Um, but yeah, not, again, like the key theme is uh, understand what the opportunities get being given to you, and then take advantage of those opportunities. And right now, the opportunity I have is to to define myself as a as a very good stand up in this country, um, and so I'm going to take that opportunity and, and run with it. That's great. And do you still feel passionate about comedy? Like, are you still in love with it? Or, of course, yeah. I mean, you know, you it's a it's a it's a love hate relationship, but it's mostly love. Uh, the hate is the the work and like the, the kind of the rote part of it. It's not the work. The work is actually a lot of fun. Like, I'm gonna hop off this call and uh, uh, get back into my daily schedule. But the work being like, now I, I outline my set. Now I gotta go. Uh, and added a bunch of new stuff. Now I got to go write all those jokes and see where they go and have fun fucking doing that. And that's like that much I like a lot. The touring aspect of it is difficult. Uh, you know, it's a lot. It's like just physically a lot. But again, like I'm having fun. I'm young. Uh, not as young as you guys, but uh, uh, you know, always being like first people's being people's first comedian is like an insane honor. Um, because you know, Chris Rock and Russell Peters are my first comedians, you know, and so it's like I might be that for somebody, it's kind of cool, uh, yeah. to know and uh, expand the comedy audience and the art form as much as I can. Um, so yeah, I mean, if there's if there's a hate, it's from like you know, a joke not working or some shit, but overall, yeah, I mean, uh, I love it, it's the best. Uh, I don't really do anything, so <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's a lot of fun.
But thank you so much for doing this. I wish you luck on your tour and the rest of your career. Um, thank you very much, Sophia. Let me know where this uh, podcast lives when it ends up and uh, send me whatever clips you want me to share, all right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you. All right. Take Bye. care. Hope Bye. to see you in Bridgeport. Yeah. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye.